Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, How to Use CRISPR-Cas9 for Knockout, Knock-In, and Gene Activation, presented by Amanda Haas, Product Manager at Horizon Discovery. I am Marin Mayer Gross at Horizon Discovery, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Horizon Discovery. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like at any time during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box located at the far left of your screen and click on the Send button. We'll save several questions for Amanda to answer during the Q&A session. Additionally, we have a technical support scientist standing by to answer questions as they come in during the presentation. We will answer as many questions as we can. If there are questions that don't get answered during the presentation, we will send an email response in the coming days. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, click on the two arrow symbol at the top right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem through the Ask a Question box. Continuing educational credits are offered for attending this webinar. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Amanda Haas. She is a product manager at Horizon Discovery. Amanda joined DharmaCon, now Horizon Discovery, in 2005 and has worked in multiple departments, including manufacturing, chemistry, biology R&D, and product management. Currently, she is responsible for custom synthetic manufacturing and Cas9 nuclease products. Throughout her time here, she has contributed to research projects and new product development in multiple areas across RNA interference and CRISPR-Cas9 genome engineering. Amanda received her degree in chemistry at the University of Miami in 2003. Now let's get started. Amanda, I'll now hand the reins over to you. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I am excited to talk to you about considerations and reagent selection for using CRISPR-Cas9 in several different applications. As a quick overview, I will walk through some background on CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, and then give some considerations that are important in, in guide RNA design. Next, we will look at several different applications using CRISPR for knockout, knock-in, and transcriptional gene activation. As a reminder, if any questions come up during this presentation, please feel free to use the Ask a Question button to send your questions in. First, I'm going to give a brief introduction to CRISPR-Cas9 so that we will all be on the same page about how this system works. So what are CRISPR-Cas systems? CRISPR-Cas, as a term, originated in 2002 to describe the bacterial immunity system evolved to defend against genetic parasites. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats and CAS stands for CRISPR-associated proteins. So why do bacteria need this system? Bacteria need an adaptable immune system to generate resistant mutants because phages outnumber and evolve much faster than bacteria. The way this works is that the bacteria acquire foreign DNA from any invading substance. Then they integrate this into their own genome at a specific CRISPR locus. The bacteria express the integrated foreign DNA sequences as guide CRISPR RNAs that can interact with the Cas proteins 
to cause interference of any incoming viral or plasmid activity by cleaving complementary sequences. Through this mechanism, bacteria can eliminate foreign invading substances that are like things that they have encountered in the past. CRISPR-Cas9 was adapted for use in mammalian genome editing by introducing the bacterial system into mammalian cells. The native S. pyogeny system, shown on the left, consists of a Cas9 protein and two RNAs, the CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA. Additionally, you can use a chimeric single-guide RNA, or sgRNA, as shown here on the right, where the CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA are linked into a single molecule. When the system is delivered or expressed in mammalian cells, it can cause a double-strand break. The resulting double-strand break can then be repaired by endogenous mammalian repair mechanisms. Two of the major pathways in mammalian cells for such repair are non-homologous end-joining, or NHEJ, and homology-directed repair, or HDR. NHEJ can result in several outcomes, including repair to wild type, insertions or deletions, known as indels. These indels can create a frame shift mutation or premature stop codon, which results in functional gene knockout. On the other hand, HDR is used <clears throat> for precise genome engineering, such as inserting a point mutation or generating a knock-in. It requires a donor DNA template for repair of the double-stranded break. HDR typically has lower overall efficiency compared to NHEJ, but can result in a precise genomic edit. Even though CRISPR-Cas9 is a relatively new technology, there have already been thousands of publications. The rapid development of this technology has quickly expanded its scope into disease treatment and personalized medicine, and new applications are being found every day. It is an incredibly exciting time to be working in this field, and there is huge potential for the future. So before we get into the details of CRISPR applications, I want to discuss considerations for guide RNA design and the impact they can have on all CRISPR-Cas9 experiments. The two aspects of guide RNA design to be considered are functionality, or how efficient the guide is at creating a double-stranded break, and specificity, what is the guide's potential for causing a break in unintended regions of the genome. I am going to walk you through our development of an algorithm for functionality, and then show you data from experiments we did looking at guide RNA specificity to minimize off-targeting. So we set out to answer the question of whether design is important for functionality or whether most CRISPR guide RNAs will just work. We performed an arrayed screen testing over 1,100 guide RNA designs spanning 10 genes, resulting in not just cutting, but a functional readout with a phenotypic reporter assay. On the right is the data for one of the genes plotted where the vertical axis represents functionality from low to high, and the x-axis is every CRISPR RNA in this gene's coding region. As you can see, there's quite a bit of variability in functionality along the coding region. If we look at the CRISPR RNAs by the arrows I've drawn on the top data set, we see very different functionality for two CRISPRs that are right next to each other, and there are many highly functional CRISPRs in the late exons shown in the circle drawn on the bottom data set. The data indicate that not all CRISPRs are equivalent, and the conventional wisdom of always target in an early exon is also not accurate. We then use the quantitative knockout data from these 10 genes to train an algorithm for functionality. After the algorithm was designed, we tested it in multiple assays. Here, I'm going to show you one example of that validation. We performed an experiment in a different cell line than what was used for the algorithm development with 10 completely different genes that then were used for the training data set. Based on the algorithm predictions, we picked the top 10 high-scoring CRISPR RNAs and the 10 lowest-scoring CRISPR RNAs for each gene. 
These were transfected into HEK293 T cells that stably express Cas9. After three days, amplicons were generated for each target sequence in the edited cells as well as untreated cells. These were indexed and pooled for NGS analysis, and the percent perfect reads of the edited cells were compared to that of the untreated cells. What we found is that high-scoring CRISPR RNAs, shown on the top graph, 93% of them had greater than 40% indel formation, while only 33% of the low-scoring CRISPR RNAs had more than 40% editing efficiency, which is shown on the bottom graph. This demonstrates that CRISPR RNAs with high functionality scores overall have higher cutting efficiency. These data show us very convincingly that our criteria for selecting highly functional guide RNAs has much improved performance over guides that were selected without these criteria. The next consideration that we wanted to evaluate was guide RNA specificity. It won't do any good to have a highly functional guide RNA if it also happens to cut multiple regions of the genome. So we need to ensure that the guide RNA doesn't have perfect matches to anything but the target gene. We performed and published a systematic study looking at the tolerance of mismatches when introduced at every position along the CRISPR RNA. Let's look at these experiments and some general conclusions. First, I want to call your attention to the diagram at the bottom of the slide. Here we are depicting genomic DNA with a PAM site being targeted by a guide RNA, which is shown in green. In the guide RNA, position 1 is the 5' most base of the CRISPR RNA, and position 20 is adjacent to the PAM site. Because we can easily make synthetic CRISPR RNAs, we were able to do a systematic and comprehensive study of all of the 1 and 2 base mismatches for two different genes, VCP and PSMD7. We used a proteasome assay for a functional GFP readout. When GFP expression is high, the indicated target gene is being knocked out. Shown in the graph are the results of a one base mismatch being walked along the 20 base guide RNA sequence. As you can see, when normalized to the perfect match guide RNA, which is the red dot for both genes, there is generally a decrease in functionality as the mismatch approaches the 3' prime end of the targeting sequence. Mismatches in positions 11 through 20 of the guide RNA result in a complete loss of functionality. We also noted that single mismatches at the 5' prime end of the target region are generally tolerated and retain some level of functionality. Here are the results for VCP with a two-base mismatch walk, again with our GFP assay. Similar to the graph on the last slide, the y-axis represents functionality, and the x-axis is all of the different combinations of two base mismatches for the guide RNA. The data was then sorted, from, sorted sorry, from highest to lowest functionality. With two mismatches, we found that less than 5% of the combinations tested retained functionality, and the combinations that did retain functionality usually included one of the mismatches being at position one, which as a reminder, is the five prime most base on the guide RNA. We had to zoom in on the graph to see the few sequences that tolerated two mismatches, which was only seven of the 190 sequences tested. Overall, these data tell us that we need to avoid guide RNAs with one or two mismatches to other regions of the genome to reduce off-targeting. So here's a quick summary of the data that I've shown on the previous slides for generating a highly functional algorithm and important considerations for guide RNA specificity. We combine these data to generate the editor algorithm, which considers both functionality and specificity and is used in designing all of our pre-designed products. So now that we're all on the same page, let's dive into some applications. First, let's look at Gene Knockout. I will walk through several applications using Gene Knockout. I will show examples of knockout for protein coding genes, 
non-coding RNA, and an example of knockout in iPS cells. For knockout, we are relying on the cell's error-prone endogenous repair mechanism, non-homologous end joining. Here, the double-strand break is introduced by the Cas9 nuclease, and the endogenous repair results in a population of cells with various indels. Like I mentioned earlier, some of these in indels will introduce premature stop codons or frame shift mutations that will result in protein knockout. Here is the experimental workflow for using CRISPR-Cas9 for gene knockout. We need two components, the Cas9 nuclease and the guide RNA. For these two components, there are many different formats available. For Cas9, there are lentiviral particles, plasmid, protein, and mRNA. For the guide RNA, options include synthetic CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, synthetic single guide RNA, lentiviral single guide particles, or lentiviral single guide plasmids. The workflow in the middle of the slide demonstrates how to create gene knockouts. Cells are transfected with Cas9 nuclease and guide RNA. At this point, several techniques can be performed, including clonal isolation or antibiotic selection, and then detection and characterization can be done by PCR-based mismatch detection, Sanger sequencing, Western blotting, or using a phenotypic assay. Here's an example of a clonal isolation and expansion workflow. Starting with the Cas9 and guide RNA source, cells are transfected or transduced, and then sorted or diluted to obtain a single cell per well. These single colonies are then grown for a period of time until there is a large enough population for the intended analysis. It is important to remember that depending on the cell line that you're using, you should be aware of the ploidy of the cell line for your gene target. Here is a simple representation of what allelic by discrimination to expect if there are only two alleles for your target gene. Wild type is when there is no edit on either allele. A heterozygous edit results from one allele being edited and the other remaining wild type. A compound heterozygous edit is when each allele has a different edit. And finally, a homozygous edit is when both alleles harbor the same edit. And keep in mind that this does become more complicated as the copy number increases, as is often the case in common tissue culture cell lines. After you have created your gene edited population or clonal cell line, you will need to analyze and characterize the edits. Here are some of the typical methods used. Mismatch detection is a simple PCR-based assay that gives you an estimation of indel formation. Although this assay is likely an underestimation of true gene editing due to the specificity of the enzyme and the sensitivity of gel analysis, it is a quick and easy way to assess editing on your cell population. Sanger sequencing allows for determination of the exact edit at the sequence level, and Western blotting, which is a nice confirmation of the intended protein knockout. This is an example of a co-transfection in HEK293T cells of an MK2 Cas9 plasmid and a CRISPR RNA targeting PPIB. Cells were flow sorted based on fluorescence and plated into single cell colonies. After the cells were expanded, we characterized 42 of the clonal lines. Here is a summary of the 42 clonal lines that were analyzed. 17 remained wild type with no edit present. The remaining 25 edited lines consisted of seven heterozygous edits, nine compound heterozygous edits, and nine homozygous edits. I will go into how we characterize these edits on the next slide. Here is an example of the Sanger sequencing that was done to confirm editing. We took the PCR product and topo cloned it and found that in the top example, there was a compound heterozygous edit with both alleles having different combinations of insertions and deletions. In the bottom example, the Sanger sequencing data shows that the same insert was present on both alleles. 
We also did Western blot analysis. We selected a subset of four of the edited clonal lines and a wild type line as a control. We confirmed by Western blot functional protein knockout of PPIB in both compound heterozygous and homozygous edited cell lines. Clearly, with the number of clonal lines that were edited, one could easily select a functional knockout to expand for further experiments. After the success of knocking out one protein at a time, we moved on to multiplexing of guide RNAs to knock out three different gene targets in a single transfection and varying the source of Cas9. For these data, we used both HEK293Ts and U2OS cells and had guide RNAs targeting AXL, DNMT3B, and PPIB. We also used stable integration, mRNA, and protein as a source of Cas9 to see if the efficiency varied based on the Cas9 source. After delivery, we diluted the cells so that there was an average of one cell per well, and we plated two full plates, so 192 wells per condition. Depending on the cell line and delivery method, we saw between 11 and 30% of the wells where single cells grew. We did notice a difference between the two cell lines, where U2OS cells were less amenable to single cell plating and so had fewer clones that grew. We Sanger sequenced a subset of the wells that grew from each condition, so let's take a look at those results. In this table, we have the cell line listed on the far left. Next is the Cas9 source that we used. Then the characterization is shown for wild type, one, two, or all three genes being edited. And finally, the column on the right shows the number of clones where all three genes are edited for every allele. Based on the cell line and Cas9 source, there is a distribution of the number of clones that have one, two, or three genes edited. One thing to note, in our delivery of Cas9 protein combined with three different CRISPR RNAs, all guide RNAs were complexed at the same time to make the RNPs. There may be improved efficiency if each CRISPR is complexed separately with Cas9 protein and then combined prior to transfection. The stable expression of Cas9 improved the overall efficiency of knockout in both cell lines tested and showed exceptional success in U2OS cells where there are up to four alleles per gene and we see that more than half of the edited clones have all alleles edited. Now moving on to our next application, which is knocking out a microRNA. MicroRNAs are non-protein coding RNAs important in gene regulation. However, they differ from protein coding genes because they are much smaller, so the sequence space to design a guide RNA is limited. Additionally, it is unknown if small indels in the stem loop of the microRNA are disruptive enough to effectively knock out the function of the microRNA. So using two guide RNAs Flanking the microRNA is an efficient approach for knockout. I will walk you through this example where we generated Cas9 expressing U2OS cells using lentiviral Cas9 and then transfected them with a pair of CRISPR RNAs flanking microRNA-221. On the right is the mismatch detection gel where we see similar levels of gene editing for all of the pairs tested, indicating that CRISPR RNA directionality and DNA target strand did not have much of an impact on experimental outcomes. So we picked CRISPR RNAs two and four for single colony expansion, several of which were then randomly chosen for further analysis. Here is the Sanger sequencing data and a functional luciferase assay for four of the clones that were selected. As you can see from the Sanger data above, clonal cell line two is wild type with no edit. Clonal lines one and four contain the expected deletion from excision by both of, CRISPR, of the CRISPR RNAs cutting, and clonal cell line three contains compound heterozygous indels between the two CRISPR RNA locations. In the graph below, you can see that the functional confirmation in a luciferase reporter assay 
where, again, clone 2 behaves like the wild type, and clones 1, 3, and 4 behave as knockout lines. Okay, so here's our last example, and this one is working in iPS cells. So the idea here is to target an essential gene that's required for maintenance of pluripotency in iPS cells in order to induce differentiation with the knockout. This slide is showing the workflow that we used for this experiment, where we made RNPs with guide RNAs targeting POU5F1, a gene known to be expressed in pluripotent cells and Cas9 protein at a 2 to 1 ratio, which we have found is optimal using Cas9 protein. iPS cells were electroporated with the RNP complex and then stained with two markers, one for differentiated cells and one that detects undifferentiated cells. We tested five different CRISPR RNAs targeting POU5F1, and shown here are the images of the untreated control and edited iPS cells stained with red CD488 and green TRA160. These are markers that detect undifferentiated and differentiated cells, respectively. You can see that as compared to the untreated control, in all five CRISPR RNAs, there is a clear shift from red to green, indicating differentiation and confirming functional knockout of POU5F1. As we have shown, gene knockout can be used in many different applications, including protein and non-coding RNA knockout using clonal cell line isolation and characterization. And additionally, we looked at editing in iPS cells, showing that knockout of pluripotency transcription factors result in differentiation in a cell population. All right, now let's switch gears and look at some knock-in applications. For gene knock-in, there are additional considerations, including the type of repair template that will be used and the composition of the donor. We will show you some in-house optimization that we have done to improve HDR efficiencies. And finally, we will walk through a few examples of fluorescently tagging a gene of interest. Here, we are focused on the right-hand side of the diagram for double-stranded break repair. For HDR, we are relying on the cell to use a provided DNA donor template containing homology surrounding the double strand break and a desired insertion. As a result, a precise DNA change is introduced in the targeted location. As shown previously, the same reagents can be used for both the source of Cas9 and the guide RNA, but we also need to have a source for the donor homology. The two formats of donor DNA that I am presenting today are single-stranded DNA oligos or a DNA donor plasmid. The workflow is similar to knockout, except for the addition and delivery optimization of the required repair template. Depending on the application you're doing, there are different repair templates that should be used. In general, for small insertions, deletions, or replacements, single-stranded DNA oligos are used where the small insert is surrounded by a stretch of homology on either side. On the other hand, for larger knock-ins, plasmid repair templates are recommended because they are more suited for larger payloads. Currently, more research is being done with different sources of donor templates, but today we will show you examples of knock-in using these two types of repair templates. Here's an example of experiments where we looked at the length of the homology arms and the concentration of the single-stranded donor oligos and the resulting efficiencies of HDR. In the left experiment, we used guide RNAs targeting two different genes and then varied the length of the homology arms to determine the optimal length. As you can see in these data, 30 to 40 nucleotides of homology on either end of the insert is optimal for HDR incorporation. In the experiment on the right, we evaluated the concentration of the donor oligo and found that between 2.5 and 10 nanomolar concentration gives the most efficient HDR integration. Because we know that HDR is much less efficient than NHEJ, 
it is important to consider these aspects during your own experimental optimization. But these general guidelines can be a good starting point. Now we are going to look at plasma donors for knock-in. As I just discussed, it is important to optimize any new elements added to your HDR experiments. Because of that, we did an optimization experiment in K562 cells, which are known to have high efficiencies of HDR, to assess the amount of donor plasmid that will give the best knock-in efficiencies. Electroporation of Cas9 protein and CRISPR RNA with increasing concentrations of a laminae EGFP donor plasmid shows correlating increase in EGFP expression, up to 32% as measured by flow cytometry. In the images here, we see the localization of the EGFP expression in the laminae knock-in samples as expected in the nucleus and co-localized with a nuclear stain. As a reminder from the previous section, we have had success using CRISPR-Cas9 for knockout in iPS cells. And we also wanted to look at knock-in of a GFP reporter in an iPSC line. For this experiment, we co-delivered an RNP with synthetic CRISPR RNA targeting SEC61 beta and an eGFP donor plasmid. These images are from 72 hours after transfection, and we can see knock-in of eGFP in a subset of the iPS cell population, and it is properly localized in the endoplasmic reticulum. This localization agrees with SEC61 beta expression. If you're interested in more information about designing successful HDR experiments, we have another webinar that walks through design and optimization for HDR as well as easy-to-use tools for both single-stranded DNA donor oligos and donor plasmid creation for precise HDR at your desired location. You can find links to these tools in the webinar library tab of this broadcast or on our website. When using CRISPR-Cas9 for knock-in, there are a few elements for consideration depending on your application. The type of donor oligo that you should use will be dependent on the length of the sequence that you want to knock in. Single-stranded DNA donor oligos are best for insertions of up to 50 bases in length, whereas plasma donors are best for larger knock-ins. Optimization is always important, but particularly so in HDR experiments, because of the lower efficiency of HDR events. Both homology arm length and concentration need to be optimized for a successful experiment. We also demonstrated precise knock-in of GFP and correct localization in both K562s and iPS cells. All right, now on to our final and very exciting application, transcriptional activation with CRISPR-A. In this section, we will discuss CRISPR-A and the ability to use the CRISPR-Cas9 system for gene activation. Additionally, we will share some experiments that we have performed looking at the effect of pooling CRISPR RNAs to the same target and downstream effects of gene activation. We will also demonstrate successful multiplexing of CRISPR-A reagents to activate multiple genes at the same time. CRISPR-Cas9 can be repurposed from a gene editing tool to a transcriptional regulation system, introducing two point mutations in the RUV-C and HNH nuclease domains, shown in the top diagram. This makes the Cas9 nuclease deficient. The modified Cas9 is commonly referred to as deactivated Cas9 or DCAS9. This non-cutting Cas9 still retains the ability to bind to guide RNAs and to target DNA in a sequence-specific manner. DCAS9 can then be fused to one or more transcriptional activators. Then, when it is guided to a gene's promoter region, it can activate transcription. Our editor CRISPR-A activation system uses DCAS9 VPR, as described in Chavez et al. 2015, and guide RNAs based on the algorithm from the Wiseman lab. The use of expressed single-guide RNAs has previously been published, but we wanted to evaluate activation using our synthetic two-part guide RNA system. 
During testing, we found that introducing modifications for nuclear resistance improves CRISPR-A transcriptional activation. So all synthetic guide RNAs include these modifications. So let's talk about some of the benefits of CRISPR-A for gene expression before we get into the data. First, it enables overexpression analysis of not just coding, but non-coding genes as well. Additionally, the size of the transcript does not affect the activation efficiency. For example, large genes require large expression plasmids, which are more difficult to transfect or package than ORFs for smaller genes. Also, it is, easy, it is easier to generate and maintain collections of small RNAs compared to ORFs, and it is highly amenable to arrayed and pooled screening. CRISPR-A makes gain-of-function research easier than ever before. Similar to gene knockout experiments, the workflow for CRISPR-A requires the same two basic components, the Cas9 nuclease and the guide RNA. For CRISPR-A, the two options for DCAS9 VPR include either lentiviral particles or plasmids. The guide RNA for CRISPR-A can be a synthetic CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, lentiviral sgRNA particles, or plasmids. The recommended workflow is to generate stable cells and then deliver your guide RNA. Following delivery, several techniques can be performed to analyze the efficiency of activation, including Western blot, RT-qPCR, and immunofluorescent imaging. We started by looking at the level of transcriptional activation across a large set of genes, shown in the upper graph. We observed that the level of activation varies depending on the gene, from a few fold to thousands of fold. Next, we looked at the basal level of expression of these genes, before activation, which is shown in the bottom graph. And we saw that for genes that are either not expressed or expressed at low levels, we generally observed higher activation, whereas the genes that are more highly expressed have lower fold activation. This is similar to what has been reported with expressed single guide RNAs in literature. It makes sense that it is easier to activate something that is not expressed than to boost the expression of a gene that is already active. So knowing the current expression level of your gene is important for understanding the fold activation that can be achieved. Several publications have shown increased activation when multiple guide RNAs were used per transcriptional start site. So we asked if pooling of CRISPR RNAs would increase transcriptional activation as well. We delivered both individuals and a pool of the four CRISPR RNAs targeting one gene to U2OS cells that stably express DCAS9 VPR. What we found was that the pooled CRISPR RNAs showed activity that is either equal to or better than the most active single CRISPR RNA. Shown here are just two examples of this. For EGFR, we see more than a two-fold increase in activation over any of the individuals. And for POU5F1, the activation of the pool is equivalent to the most functional individual CRISPR RNA, which is number one in this case. Another interesting aspect of gene activation is looking at the effects of genes that are downstream in the pathway. Here we looked at IL-1R2, which as you can see in the pathway diagram on the upper left side of the slide, when activated should inhibit the production of IL-6 and IL-8 and increase the expression of ZEB2 and GEMIN2. The upper right graph shows more than 10,000 fold activation of IL-1R2 using a CRISPR RNA pool. Then we detected the expression of the known downstream targets, shown in the lower graphs. We indeed see inhibition of both IL-6 and IL-8 and upregulation of ZEB2 and GEMIN2. This is a really nice demonstration of the utility of CRISPR-A for better understanding downstream effects. We then evaluated targeting two genes at the same time for activation. Here, we delivered CRISPR RNAs targeting either IL-1R2 or POU5F1, or both genes at the same time, in U2OS cells 
that stably express DCAS9 VPR. We looked at the best individual CRISPR RNA design, number one for POU5F1 and number two for IL1R2, and additionally the pool of four designs for each gene. RTQPCR was used to determine the fold of activation for the respective genes that were detected. On the left side of the graph, we are detecting IL1R2 expression and we see no activation when the cells are transfected with a non-targeting control or with POU5F1, but we see strong activation with the IL1R2 individual or when multiplexed with POU5F1. We see an increase in the activation with the pool for both the singular target and the multiplex target. Also, on the right side of the graph, we are now detecting POU5F1 in these samples and are observing the same pattern of activation, with the exception of the pool having comparable activity to the individual, which is consistent with what we saw a few slides ago, where the activity of the pool for POU5F1 is the same as the best performing individual CRISPR RNA. These are images of conditions from the experiment that we just discussed on the previous slide. The non-targeting control, multiplexed individuals, and the multiplexed pooled samples were fixed and stained for IL-1R2 in red and POU5F1 in green, and a nuclear dye which is shown in blue. The center image where the individual CRISPR RNAs were delivered shows good overlap of both genes being detected and expressed. And on the right, when the pools are used, we see an increased expression of IL-1R2 in red, which is in agreement with the RT-QPCR data from the previous slide. So let's look at an example of CRISPR-A in IPS cells. Here, we electroporated plasmid for DCAS9 VPR and a lentiviral sgRNA targeting POU5F1, ASCL, TTN, or EGFR. We detected activation with RT-QPCR at 72 hours post-nucleofection. On the right, we are looking at the resulting transcriptional activation. Because these are iPS cells, the basal expression of POU5F1 is already high, which is shown in the graph below with a CQ value of 17. Remember, the lower the CQ value, the higher the expression. As you can see with the other genes, where they have higher CQ values, indicating lower expression. For this gene, we are confirming what we and others have previously observed, that when there is high basal cell expression, we don't see significant further activation. We do see good activation, as expected, of the other three genes, with ASCL1 having the highest level of activation. Because ASCL1 had the most robust activation, we again looked at the change in expression level of known downstream target genes in this case, DLL1 and DLL3, as shown in the small pathway diagram at the upper right-hand side of the slide. We observed moderate activation of these downstream targets as shown in the graph on the lower right. Overall, CRISPR-A is really an exciting new tool for better understanding gene function. A few important takeaways include the ability to activate a gene being dependent on the basal cell expression, so understanding your gene's expression is important to set your expectations for activation. Both individual and pooled CRISPR RNAs work well for activation, and using pools can increase activation levels. The endogenous activation also exhibits the expected downstream gene activation, which can improve understanding of gene pathways. We also showed that multiplexing of CRISPR-A guide RNAs can activate multiple genes at the same time. We have many resources available on our website to help you design your successful CRISPR experiments, including several application notes and recommended reading lists for many different applications. We also have peer-reviewed publications from our R&D team and collaborators. There is protocols and design tools as well to help you with your design of experiments. These can be found in the application notes and web tools tabs of this broadcast or on our website. And lastly, since you've already shown interest in our webinars, be sure to check out our extensive collection of other recorded webinars.
covering a number of topics that we hope will be of interest and help you to plan your next experiments. These can all be accessed from our website and in the webinar library tab of this broadcast. Thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to take a couple of questions with the time remaining. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for the informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. While we are getting ready, two polling questions will appear on your screen. We really appreciate your answers to these questions, so we can follow up appropriately with you. I would like to remind our audience that you can submit questions by typing them in the Ask a Question box. Type your question into the box and hit send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's see. The first question in the queue is, the guide RNA algorithm that you presented was generated using CRISPR RNAs. Does it also work with single guide RNAs? Yeah, so during our algorithm development, um, we made sure to compare different guide RNA designs and tested the functionality between those different formats. Um, we tested these in multiple different assays as well. And what we found is there's really good correlation between the different formats of guide RNAs and that we see good functionality when using our algorithm across all of those different guide RNA designs. Thanks, Amanda. Um, okay, and on to another question from one of our viewers. Uh, what is the method for obtaining single cell per well for clonal isolation? Sure, so in the examples that we showed today, we used a few different methods. Um, in the first examples, we used fact sorting to sort the cells into single cells because we had that MK fluorescence that we could use for sorting. There are going to be cell-specific characteristics regarding the ability of the cell to maintain, to survive after it's been sorted that will need to be considered when you do single cell sorting. Uh, it, for, for example, um, some cells you may actually need to plate a lot more cells to be able to maintain enough viable cells to, to grow those out. Um, in other examples, we also used a dilution method. In this procedure, we dilute the cells from the edited population into an average of less than one cell per well, and then that mixture is plated into 96 well plates, and we look at how many of those single colonies uh, grow up into populations. Uh, thank you. Let's see. The next question I have here is, um, how many gene targets can be multiplexed for CRISPR activation? So in our testing, we've tested up to three genes at a time. And what we've seen is consistent with the data that I showed today, where we see activation of all three genes at equivalent levels to individual activation of those genes. We haven't pushed this further, but I certainly think that this could be, um, could be done and could really help with understanding more complex pathways where you'd like to look at multiple genes being activated at the same time. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, all right, let's see. The next question in the queue is, um, what is the iPS cell line that you are working with, and how does it compare to the human embryonic stem cell H19 line? Hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we're using a Gibco cell line that's derived from CD34 positive progenitor cells. Um, I'm not sure that I can exactly say how these two lines compare, um, but generally, anytime you're working with a cell line in an application and that's the first time you've been doing that, as we mentioned several times, you really need to look at optimization. Um, this includes the growth conditions, the type of reagents, as well as your delivery method. Um, we've tested about 30 or so IPS lines in our R&D groups, and we've noticed that nucleofection is typically the best delivery system, um, and that when those IPS cells are cultured in an E8 media, they tend to have a higher editing efficiency. If you want any more specifics on this, clearly uh, reach out to our, our technical support staff on, on the line um, or send those questions in, and we'd be happy to provide you with some of that information. Oh, excellent. That's very helpful, I'm sure. Um, let's see. The next question is, uh, okay. 
do you have CRISPR activation libraries and how much do they cost? <laughs> So this is something that we have been hearing a lot of um, since we launched our CRISPR-A product line. People, I think, are really excited about looking at gain of function using CRISPR-A. We are launching CRISPR-A libraries this week as catalog items for both human and mouse. Um, smaller custom libraries are also available if you have your own gene list and can be ordered with our Cherry Pick Plater tool, which is available on our website. Um, in terms of price, it really has a lot to depend, it depends a lot on exactly what you're looking at doing. The amount of material that you're going to need, how large of a library it is, um, as well as the format of the plates that you want is going to dictate that price. So unfortunately, I can't give you exact pricing for those, um, for those libraries. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm being told that we're approaching the end of our time allotment. So let's go ahead and answer one more question. Here we go. Um, can I use your guide RNAs with CPF1 or Staph aureus Cas9? So we only provide pre-designed guide RNAs for S. pyogenes Cas9. However, you can do guide RNA design using our custom guide RNA design tools for any species. Um, these can be custom ordered. You would just select enter your own guide RNA sequence and then enter them in. And depending on what CAS you're using, you would also need to order a custom tracer to go with that to make sure that you have all of the right pieces involved um, for those experiments. All right. Thank you. Um, again, thank you to the audience for all the great questions and Amanda for your answers. Um, and I see that there are several questions remaining in the queue. If your question was not answered, someone from our technical support team will respond to you via email. If you have further questions that, did not, that you did not submit during this broadcast, please email them to ts.dharmacon at horizondiscovery.com. All right, before we go, we would like to thank Lab Roots and Horizon Discovery for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through September. Lab Roots will alert you via email when it's available um, for replay on demand. We encourage you to share the email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live events. Um, until next time, goodbye. <laughs>